to the Mom Initiative. My name is Amy, and I have the privilege of being one of the moms on the mom team, serving with this wonderful group of women. Um, this is our matriarch Bible study, our 13-week Bible study of women of the Bible. I pray that uh, God has been teaching you some things through these lessons that we've been learning. I know he's been teaching me some things. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm a homeschooling stay-at-home mom of three. I have a 10-year-old daughter, an 8-year-old son, and a 1-year-old son. Um, and I have about 8,000 jobs. I am currently, let's see, mom, teacher, writer, chef, laundress, housekeeper, um, chauffeur, entertainer, wife. Let's see, I could probably come up with about 20 more things. And you could probably add quite a few more things as well with it, with whatever's going on in your life. And if you're working, you can add employee or boss. There's just things that are always on our plates as moms. And it's amazing how we can feel like um, we live kind of a life in the background and maybe don't get a lot of recognition for what we do. And I feel like the mom that we're studying today can teach us a lot about that. Um, that even though we live our lives in a little bit of obscurity, that doesn't necessarily mean that our lives are unimportant. Um, there are things that we use every day, things that we deal with every day that obscure people have created and used that we might not know their names, but we but we use their products all the time. Uh, we don't know the person who decided to look at a tree and go, I bet we can make paper from that, but we use paper every day. So just because we don't know their name doesn't mean that they're unimportant. They're obscure, not unimportant. Um, and we could probably come up with dozens more examples of that. Today we're going to be talking about a mom that seems like she might have lived an obscure life, but we're going to see that her obscurity also did not equal being unimportant. Um, this is a mom that you've heard of many times, but you may not actually know if she has a name. I know that I've been a Christian a very long time, and when I realized who she was and saw her name, I actually had to Google it to make sure I could pronounce it properly since I was going to be speaking to you. Her name is Salome. Her son you and said, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, would you would you have my son sit on your right and your left? Um, see now you're now you're thinking of her. You're it's ringing a bell now. Um, it's really interesting. You know, some women have these long narratives in the Bible telling us l these long stories about their lives, and sometimes even when somebody has a significant impact on the gospel story, you still only get bits and pieces of her, and that's the way um, we learn about Salome. There's actually only three recorded um, incidences of her life in, in the Word. Um, one is Matthew 20. That's where we learn about the incident where she comes before Jesus and asks if her sons can sit on their right and their left. Uh, in Matthew 15, we learn that she was present at the crucifixion of Jesus with the other women who came because she was part of the women followers that followed from Galilee and were ministering to him. In Mark 16, we learn that she was with the ladies who came to the tomb with the spices to prepare his body and found the empty tomb. Uh, I don't think that I had ever realized that those three women were the same. And it's been really interesting to study that, especially as someone who has been a Christian for what feels like since the womb. And so when I read something new and learn something new about the Bible, it's just, it opens my eyes to all new things. Um, because when you read between the lines of her life, you can learn so many things. So from these three accounts, we can read between the lines and learn a few things about her life. We know that she was the wife of Zebedee, who was a wealthy fisherman. We know that she had taught her children well the ways of the Lord because when Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee and said, come follow me, James and John were ready and willing to jump off that boat. Um, so we know that Zebedee and Salome had taught them well. Um, from some of the other parts of her life, we can also see that she was constantly doing what she thought was best for her children, but sometimes overstepping, which made me very much think of me. She was very human. So we get good things out of her life, and we also learn lessons from her not to do, which I feel like makes her very human. So I really enjoyed her. Um, there was also something else from her life, which I thought was very interesting because I had never considered this. Um, there's a lot of debate about it. But a lot of scholars agree that she may have been the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um, based on John 19, 25, when it, when it says, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. In Mark 15, 40, in the same account, um, 
they use the set they use that sequence of names but instead of the, the words his mother's sister they actually use the name Salome so from these things they've put together that she may have very well been Mary's sister which is amazing when you think about it because that would have made her Jesus's aunt which would have also made John and James Jesus's cousins that just it opened up whole new channels for me because I had never even thought about the fact that James and John may have been related to Jesus. Um, I might have just never actually thought through it enough, but I think I had always just assumed that they didn't know him personally before he came and called them. But it's a whole different thing to think that they might have grown up near him. Um, that if if Salome was Mary's sister, then she would have been a witness to the entire nativity story. She would have known about the virgin birth. She would have seen the way that Mary and Joseph were scorned in their hometown, that people didn't believe her. She would have, she, I wonder if she even had a problem believing her own sister when her sister said, no, this was, I'm a virgin. This was from the Holy Spirit. Just to, just to realize that James and John may have been a part of that all along. It's very interesting to think through. Um, she, you know, did, did the children grow up playing together? Did she ever notice that there was something different about Jesus than her own children? Um, maybe maybe the, when the kids were playing, he was the only one who wasn't disobeying or talking back to their mother or, or something like that. Did she notice these things? It's just, it opens a whole different thought process. Um, you know, were, were James and John, did they know he was the Messiah? Were they waiting to be part of, of his group of disciples? Did they know that one day he would, he would, come into his ministry and call people and they were just ready to be one of them. Um, we don't know. We don't know. Um, because even the scholars who have studied this thing for, you know, decades um, still disagree on it. But, uh, but I know a lot of them do. And so it was just a whole interesting thing for me to think through. Either way, sister or not, we know that she was a faith faithful worshiper of God and that she had taught her children to be as well. James and John, like I said, were so ready to jump out of the boat. They were ready and willing. They were waiting for the Messiah to come. So we know that their mother taught them faithfully. When, so in stepping back and looking at Salome's life from the outside in, um, there are two lessons I think that we can glean from her story as mothers who are trying to raise our children to love the Lord. Um, and just like with us, there are some good lessons and some bad lessons. So you take the good, you take the bad. Um Lesson one that I think we learned from her life is that she raised her children to follow the Lord and then she released them to do it. Um, Salome was a shining example of a mother who raised her children and then gave them up. Um, we know from bits and pieces of the gospel narrative that she had agreed with their decision to follow Jesus. We know this because not only did she let them go, but she also followed him. Um, she appears to have been one of the disciples that followed Jesus from Galilee from the very beginning. Later, it says she was with the women who had followed him since Galilee. So from the very beginning, um, a lot of scholars, you know, it kind of makes you wonder why she would have done that. But later on in the stories, it starts to introduce her as the mother of James and John instead of the wife of Zebedee, which would have traditionally been the way she was introduced. So a lot of scholars think maybe he possibly had died at this point and she was a widow. Um, we don't know, but that might be why she felt released to go and follow Jesus. Um, so not only did she raise her children to love the Lord, give them open handed to Jesus, but she also was willing to follow him herself. So she was not only a good example in teaching them, but also a good example of being a mother who was willing to follow him herself, to do where God to go where God has led her as well. Um, and I know, at least for myself, this is a desire I have as a mother. I want very much to teach my children to love the Lord. I, I want very much to spend my life teaching them to follow Christ and then hopefully to one day be able to come to God open-handed and say, what do you want of our children? Um, it's very hard to pray open-handed to God about our children. Um, it's kind of scary as much as, you know, I'm in ministry. My husband is a, is a university pastor. We've been in ministry a very long time, but it's still kind of scary sometimes to think of releasing our children into that because there's been beautiful times, but there's also been very hard times. Um, it just, it's, 
it feels so much easier to pray and hope that our children will do something that we think will be easy, whereas we know nothing in life would be easy. A regular job would not make their life easy. But I really pray that I would one day be the kind of mother um, that would say, whatever you would have for me. You want them to be missionaries in a far off land where I'll never see them. If that's what you want for their lives, then that's what I want for their lives. Um, And I feel like that's what Salome did. She raised them. And when he called, she sent them. I'm sure she, you know, as a mother, as a human mother, probably had desires for, for them to marry and to have grandchildren and things like that. But you, at least in the story, never, her, never see her trying to pull them back. She, she says go, and then she goes as well. So I feel like that's a huge example for us as mothers to be teaching our children the ways of the Lord and then bringing them to God open-handed and saying, what do you have for them? What do you want for their lives? So maybe just something to think about is as a mother, when you pray for your children, are you praying for them open-handed? Are you praying for them? Are you bringing, you know, a notepad of things that you've written down and that you know that you want for their lives and saying, here, God, bless, you know, my desires for their life? Or are you coming to them empty-handed, coming to him empty-handed and saying, write their story. Um, Show me what to do and you write their story. Um, So just something to think about when you're praying for your children. And also, are your children seeing in you that you are willing to lead where, to go where God is leading you. Um, one of my friends just today, they're going on a mission trip next week and her daughter's going to be going with them and her daughter's going to be turning 11 while they're there. So it's going to be her birthday. And she asked her child, you know, what do you want for your birthday? Do you want me to bring you something, something you can open there? And she said her daughter thought for a minute and then she said, I just want to serve people on my birthday. And my first thought was, of course, that's what she thought, because she's watching you. And what I see in my friend is constant service. She's always serving other people. So her daughter is watching her serve people. And she's learning that the important thing is not to get things for herself, but to be serving other people. So are we as mothers, are we being good examples to our children in going where God is leading us? Are they watching us and seeing this in us as well? So the first thing was that she was open-handed with her children. She raised them to love the Lord and she released them to it. Um, the second thing is like, like I said, you take the good, the take you bad. You take the good, you take the bad. Um, and it's, it's not all bad, but she was also ambitious for her children. Um, and I think we can all say this about ourselves, but wh- I, why is it that we, we can have a thousand shining wonderful moments as moms you know where we bake the best cupcakes for the cupcake for the birthday parties or we you know make the best costume for Halloween and our kids are just loving it we throw the best but you know when we hit it out of the park as moms you know but nobody remembers that it seems like that it's that one time that we really screw up where we forget to you know send our kid to school with lunch or something like that it's those those times that we screw up that seem to stick out and I feel like that's what happened with Salome through history Um, because it takes cross-referencing to figure out that she was also the woman at the crucifixion or the woman that was um, at the tomb to to figure out that it's the same woman who came to Jesus asking about her sons. Um, So what stands out about her is that she came to Jesus with this ambitious request of her children. Um, So she she was remembered as a mother who just didn't get the concept of the kingdom and was overly ambitious for her boys. Uh, in Matthew 20 verses 20 to 24 is where we find the most well-known passage about this mother. When she approaches Jesus with her request, she comes and she kneels at the feet of Jesus and she asks him if he will grant that her two sons, James and John will sit at his right and his left when he comes into his kingdom. And this request seems to come just as much from them as it does from her because they are right there with them. Because when Jesus said, are you willing to drink this cup that I'm going to drink? They chip in and say, we are. So it's not just her. It's also them. Um, And we don't know her motivation. We don't know what motivated this question in any way. Um, It seems that the most widely viewed idea is that she was overly ambitious for them, that she knew her children well, and she thought her kids were best suited for these jobs. You know, she, she'd been following with these disciples. She looked around and she saw all these other men that were following and she knew my two boys 
are the best and should be the best. Um, so it comes out of that, that heart, it seems like. Um, but we have to be reminded that she's not talking about a heavenly kingdom. We have, you know, we have the benefit of being able to look back on the story and know what's going to happen, but they didn't know that at the time. And even these disciples that had been following Jesus for a long time, and he had been teaching them and telling them, they still, you see it so much in the scriptures that he still, they still didn't seem to get it. So what she was thinking was of an earthly kingdom, even though he taught them many times, she still had an earthly kingdom mindset. So when she said, grant that my children can sit on your right and your left, she this was not some audacious request because her children were worthy of being divine. This was basically the same thing as her saying, Jesus, as you are ushered into your pre- your presidency, grant that my sons could be your vice president and your chief of staff. This was a political request for power. Um, because like I said, this, they still had this earthly kingdom mindset. They thought that they, you know, they were going up to Jerusalem, right? Then Jesus had told them, this is where we're going. This is what's going to happen. But even though he tells them, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again. They don't really understand what all that means. What they think is still going to happen is there's going to be, they're going to be walking into triumph. It's going to be a conquering hero and a ruler, So it may have been a misguided request, but it's still something that we as mothers can all relate to, ambition for our children. Um, Our society has led us to believe that if we want to be the best parents, that we have to give our children the best things, that they need to have the best opportunities. And the only way that we can succeed as their parents is if we are making sure that they always have the best. Um, And our ambition for our children, loving or not, might not always be what is best for them. Um, Her request, her ambition for her children was to have power and glory. But Jesus knew when he corrected her and said, you don't understand what you're saying. He was right Um, because her request for power and glory really was going to be for pain and suffering. She didn't understand what she was asking for. Um, And we, the same thing. When we give our children everything they need or everything they want or all the best um, all the best experiences, it might not be what's best for our children. Um, My husband and I work with college students. We've worked with college students for a very long time. And especially lately, um, as the years pass, we see more and more people who come into college unable to handle life. They've been given everything they ever needed. They've been helped through life by their parents with just about everything possible that when they get into college, they can't handle the real world. They buckle under the pressure of studying for these tests or or keeping a job or, or paying bills and things like that because we as parents as a society have given them everything they need. And because of that, we've crippled them in being able to just live in the real world. Our ambition for our children um, causes our judgment to be clouded as parents. And a lot of times this will hold them back. So just as Jesus lovingly teaches Salome um, that she doesn't know what she's talking about, he may be telling us the same thing for our children, that what we think they need will not ultimately lead to their good. So it kind of comes back to the same thing. Are we, are we praying for our children with open hands? Are we coming to him open-handed and saying, you know, this is my ambition for my children, but what is yours? This is my idea, but what is yours? So just learning from her that sometimes we mess up and Jesus still loves us. He didn't harshly rebuke her and tell that, tell her that she was wrong. He just lovingly corrected her. And um, I feel lovingly corrected a lot as a mother. So thankfully, Jesus's steadfast love corrects us and doesn't strike us down. Um So we as mothers need to learn to come to Jesus with requests, his requests, requests for his will for our children, not for our will for our children. Um, So I see myself in Salome, a lot of myself in Salome, and I bet you do too, because we as mothers, you know, you're probably not here even listening to this if you don't desire to do what's best for your children and to learn how to be a better mother. I know I'm, I'm, I'm praying and trying to learn better every day because I screw up every day. So it's so good to me to see an example of a mother in the Bible that, like, like I said, you take the good, you take the bad. She, she wanted what was best, but she still messed up sometimes.
So what I'm praying that we learn from Salome as mothers is that we will spend our time, even if it's time in the background, um, in the obscurity of just everyday life, and no one ever recognizes us, that we will still spend our time teaching our children to love the Lord and to follow Him and to be willing to go where He wills for for their lives. And that we'll also be good examples as mothers to them as they watch us, that we'll be doing what we feel like God is calling us to do. And that we'll also be coming to God open-handedly with our children, that we'll be praying for, for their lives and for their futures, but we'll be doing it with His will in mind and not with our playbook already written that we will understand that our ambitions for our kids might not be what's best for them, but God knows what is best for them, and he will lovingly lead them. Um, I also pray that Salome's life will give us encouragement that sometimes even the best moms mess up, um, because none of us know what we're doing, honestly, and um, that's why we all need Jesus. So thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you soon. 